So today's the day body cameras on police take a big step forward here in Boston. As Police Commissioner Bill Evans told us on Boston Public Radio yesterday, 100 officers are being identified today to start a trial program. This comes after an effort to recruit volunteers went nowhere fast. We've all been reading the papers. Right. Zero volunteers. Is yeah. that true? Uh, Zero? Yeah. Is, is this it, all about the contract negotiations? Well, I, I don't think it is, Jim. It's about change and, uh, you know, it's a whole new way of the way they're going about their job. And, you know, obviously, uh, I think they do a great job and I, I don't think they have much to hide. But I knew talking six months ago that, you know, with collective bargaining, this was going to be an issue. And it turned out to be true. The unions in Boston are not happy. We tried to get a comment from them, but our calls were not returned. This morning, Mayor Walsh said he's still committed to launching the program. My thoughts are that we told the people in Boston would have body camera program, and we're moving forward with a body camera program, and it's, it's out in the street. Some Massachusetts communities have already launched pilot programs. We showed you earlier this year how cameras were being rolled out in Methuen. Although there was some initial concern among the officers, Chief Joseph Solomon explained how he thought, in today's world, this technology can actually protect his officers. This is what we've seen traditionally. Someone goes out there and they do this with the camera, and they send in 30 seconds of video of an incident, but the incident took 10 minutes, and everybody in the country says, oh my God, look at that 30 seconds of video. How did the cops do this? Well, this gives us a bird's eye view of the whole situation. Chief Solomon said a national research shows that 90% of the time when a complaint is filed and body camera video is entered as evidence, the officer ends up being exonerated. Joining me to talk about the cameras and the divide it has produced in Boston are former Massachusetts Attorney General Martha Coakley, who is now with Foley Hoag in Boston. Martha, it's nice to see you. Thank you. And Jeff Zarnick of Southern New Hampshire University's Criminal Justice Program is also a cop on the Manchester Police Force for 23 years. Jeff, it's great to meet you. Thank you. Same here. So there will be a hundred in this pilot program, Martha Coakley, but 100 who are being forced to do what they didn't volunteer for. How are we to expect success when there's a directive from above telling cops, who I think for the most part aren't crazy about being told do that, how are we to expect success when there's this pull, drag, kicking, and screaming? Well, that's one issue. It would probably work better with volunteers and people who said, I'm willing to try this and see how it works. Not one. Not one volunteer. Not one volunteer. And so that is going to have an impact, I think, on whether the pilot's successful or not. There's no question about it. So whether this is fair or not, Jeff, when there are no volunteers, and there seems to be pretty broad community support for this, what message are the cops in Boston sending to that community, even if they're not 100% right about it, saying, you want this program, not one of us, mm -hmm. e even though they agreed that there'd be a voluntary pro a pilot program, not one of us is gonna offer to participate in the program. I would just urge those people on the sidelines to not look at it as a message, but more as an assumption that they are maybe uh, being surreptitious, they're hiding something, that they don't want to be exposed for any of the alleged bad behaviors that they've been indicted for, et cetera, here and across the country. So it's more about, I think, there's a, they need to understand there's more questions to be asked about adding another tool to police service, which unto itself is ill-defined and can change from block to block, and the expectations um, are really very, very gray. So you buy into this notion that Commissioner Evans was saying yesterday. I think he was pretty, being pretty generous to his uh, men and women on his force, saying it's a new thing, it takes a while getting used to. You buy into that notion, that that's part of the reluctance here? I think it's part of it, but they have to also look at the fact that, you know, Boston PD enjoys a very high, high level of intellectual capital from the service providers on through. They are designed, they've been taught, trained, and otherwise to ask questions. Is, is this tool going to help? And have all the questions been asked and answered? What type of effect is it going to have on, the, on police service and the dialogue that they have with the community? Uh, is it going to align with the expectations of the, those people who have not come forward and expect a higher level of aggressive police service, more interactions, more interruptions, and to say suspicious or furtive behavior, right? So a lot more questions need to be asked, and that's, I think, making a, a safe assumption, they just want some of these questions answered first. What will the effect be on police service on the macro side? Well, they didn't ask me, but I'll answer their question. Their answer is, if you're doing nothing wrong, then you have nothing to fear. Often we hear that from police officers or former DAs or attorneys general. And you look at the case in Milwaukee. This is actually mentioned on the radio by Commissioner Evans yesterday. The body camera actually helped the situation by showing that despite what some community members were saying, the young man who was shot actually had a had gun a in his hand. And there have been instances of that in Boston when the video was actually very helpful. And I think there's a sense that it will avoid complaints, just not fatal shootings. But I do think that 
you need to move slowly to make sure you do it right. There are exactly. definitely it's not been like only, a year and a half slowly. They well, a year, whatever it is. But, but, but the idea, Jim, we have never done this before. This is a new idea. Think if you had to wear a body camera in your job. We don't make anybody else do this. And some of the message to police is we don't trust you. Mm. We don't believe you. I've worked with them for many, many years. As you know, I'm married to one. <laughs> and we true. have to be understanding that this is a huge change for what they think their job is. And I understand understand that there are some benefits that will come and I think will come to police but there still have to be rules around privacy and remember there are a lot of folks here who are concerned about Fourth Amendment issues, and I guarantee you... But all you, that stuff's been negotiated, no, Martha Coakley. I mean, they've no, dealt the, with we, a lot of the details. But, this but we don't have the rules exactly as to when the camera t gets turned off. There will be discretion involved for officers, right, about uh, a witness who doesn't want to be on camera, a sexual assault victim. And so those are important things, and I guarantee you if police had come forward and said, we want to wear cameras because we think it will help us do our job better, you and a lot of people like you would say, oh, no, that's a violation so of the Fourth why did Amendment. They, so then mm -hmm. why did the police union even sign this agreement to begin with, saying we'll have a voluntary program I where they had these concerns and I, can't I would assume that. knew that none of them were going to volunteer? Well, I don't know. I can't speak to that. And I think, look, this, this ship has sailed in many respects, and we know that. Uh, there are cameras all over New York. You can't walk in New York without being videoed. And I think the chief is right. You know, police have to assume that someone else is going to take video, particularly with an encounter or an incident. But I think it has to be done with police understanding that and having time to agree to it. So we'll see what happens. She's talking about the rank and file. It seems to me that if you're a commissioner or you're a leader of a police force in some capacity now, you have no ability to say no, even if you have every concern Martha Coakley says, and then some. And by the way, frankly, Commissioner Evans wasn't crazy about this all along. Midway through, he'd say, we're going to do it, but I'm not sure we need it. My cops are great cops. It was almost like, I'll do it because I have to. In this political environment, mm -hmm. you really can't say no. An officer can, maybe, but a boss and a police force can't say no, can it was, they? It was a very slippery slope for anybody who's in an administrative position that they have to, uh, not, I, wanna, I don't want to use the word pandering, but they do have to respond in order to satiate maybe the demands of the most vocal. And in some respects, that's really not fair because there are a lot of people out there that ha they're not going to have the word, uh, they're not going to have their voice heard in terms of what they expect from the police. Well, isn't accountability, though, a reasonable demand to make? Particularly, you know, I, I would assume if you were to stop 100 Bostonians on the street, 98 of them would say, we know this police force is not Ferguson, it is not Baltimore, it is not Chicago, this is Boston, they are better. However, mm -hmm. in this environment, we want accountability. And so, again, you have nothing to fear. I want to move but something this else. Is why, but but yeah. this is why we should have a pilot and see what well, it is. What a pilot. Is it, and yeah. But if there's only a pilot, we can't even get volunteers for a pilot. How does that bode for a permanent thing post this six-month trial? Because Not well. once they use it and they see that it works, as we saw with child abuse interviewing, you can change techniques when people accept them. I yeah. just think it's going okay, to be difficult. Okay, I've got to move ahead here because sure. I've met another major controversy involved. On this one, the union and the commissioner are on the exact same side. Another issue is outraging both those constituencies. A political cartoon appeared in the Globe on Monday. On one side, it shows a police officer holding a document for white people. It says their Miranda rights, and you have a right to remain silent, etc. On the other side, an officer holds a similar paper for black people. It says it's their last rights. The cartoon was created by an artist for the Atlanta Constitution, reprinted by The Globe. Today, in The Globe's paper, it was filled with a number of responses, letters to the editor from police organizations around the country, saying The Globe, quote, should be ashamed for publishing Mr. Lukovic's cartoon and the hate it endorses, and the quote, in a sensitive time in our country with racial tensions running high, riots happening in Milwaukee. Last thing we need is for the media to print inflammatory cartoons. And The Globe editorial page editor herself, Ellen Clegg, defended the publication and saying the cartoons by nature are provocative, no matter the opinion expressed, and the paper gave ample room for a rebuttal. Should they have run that? You know, First Amendment notwithstanding, I think it was outrageous and inappropriate. To run it at all? Yeah. You don't think that, it, I mean, there's no question it's provocative. There's no question it's extreme. It wasn't funny but doesn't and it, it was spe inappropriate. Well, it wasn't intended to be funny. It was well, intended to highlight a problem that at least affects a, a segment of America, But no. even cartoons should have some measure of balance and truth in them, and it just went beyond the balance They were wrong to run it. Yeah. Were they wrong to run it? 
Um, Jeff, the retired cop, says yes. I find it to be poor taste. How about Jeff, the cop, for 23 years? Yeah, well, yes, I think it's poor taste from the professional standpoint. As a civilian um, and as an academic, I think the provocation is good. It does create dialogue. I think the response to it has been very good. Mm -hmm. It's healthy to continue with dialogue. Eventually, there'll be some type of resolution. And police departments have always, Jim, always been fodder for some form of attack. And it's been going back since they were first created. This is not new. On that note, but we want a healthy dialogue, not an adversity. I, one I that absolutely creates agree. Creates more volatility in this relationship. And it's much too easy. Aren't to Aren't you do supposed that. to say I still believe in the First Amendment? Isn't that what you're supposed I to say? I do okay, still I believe in be the clear. First Amendment. Absolutely. <laughs> it's nice to see you. Good Jeff. to see you, Jeff. Thank you very much. Same here. Thank you.